in the Middle Ages, people have been trying for centuries to be able to take metal and to turn that metal into gold. Now we can, every day. Welcome to Process Pioneers, the show that takes a deep dive into the minds of decision makers, key influencers, and process experts who are pioneering the world of everything process. Welcome to the next episode of Process Pioneers. My name is Daniel Rayner. I'm the host of Process Pioneers. And in each of these episodes, I get the absolute privilege of sitting down with uh, various digital transformation practitioners, uh, whether they are working internally at organizations, whether they are coming in from a consulting lens, whether they work in academia. Um, We try to bring on a wide range and a variety of different guests onto this show um, to look at and tackle the topic of digital transformation. Um, And in today's episode, I have the absolute privilege of sitting down with Rick Vera. Uh, Now, Rick is an international keynote speaker, a thought leader, business philosopher, author, coach, coach, consultant, and guest lecturer on developing a sustainable strategy in a digitized, customer-centric ecosystem economy. Um, And we are going to dive into that and unpack uh, what that all means in a moment. But Rick, I just want to thank you for joining me today. Yeah, and I just realized that's quite a lot in one sentence, so sorry for that. (laughs) (laughs) No, that's fantastic. I think something our our, uh, audience loves to find out from our guests is um, where did you get started? So I guess in, in, I guess your area of expertise looking at that customer centricity, when were you first introduced to this concept and take us on a bit of a journey leading up to what you're doing today? It's very simple. I had to. I've I've spent the the first 20 years of my career in the most boiling red ocean worldwide, which is the carpet industry. So I was the first I started in sales and sales and marketing, you know, you know the drill, and I ended up like a CEO in in that type of companies. Right. Um, But it's it's a boiling red ocean for two reasons. First of all, there is the inertia of the of the industry that is still building new plants or while still in building new plants and new machinery and more production capacity. And the other hand, that was a declining market. So a declining market and ever more competition and ever more production facilities, that is a boiling red ocean. So being responsible for companies in that boiling red ocean, I have to look for, hey, how can I be a good manager and how can I bring value for the company? Right. And I soon found out that there were three things I needed to do. First of all, um, be different. If I, if I did everything that like the industry did, I would never be able to do something differently and stand out of the crowd. So mm. the first thing was think about, and I'm talking the nineties and the early zeros, thinking about why does this industry do what it does? And right. what's the reason? The second is um, being extremely customer centric because if there was one thing that this industry was doing was we have a production facility, we have products, and now let's find customers for that product. So I thought if I can reverse this and start with a customer, there's production capacity, there's enough production capacity, I don't have to bother about production capacity. I have to bother about my customers. And if right. I find customers, and if I treat customers right, that's production capacity. So I reverse the angle um, and the order of things. And, <laughs> and the, third, the third was, again, I'm talking 90s and early zeros, that is emerging technology. Um, early zeros is the internet. And, um, it's like Amazon that started that to do their business and, and companies like Google that all of a sudden were there. And then there was social media and then there was a smartphone. So I was always intrigued by technology and I could I use technology to outrun my competition. So instead of investing in the stupid stuff that this industry was doing, like introducing six or seven new products on a yearly basis, just to please your distribution channel, knowing that the customers, the end user only buys carpet every 10 years. Why the heck do I have to introduce six new products on a yearly basis? Right. What, what's, what's the use? What's the use of trade fairs? So instead of 
introducing six new products on a yearly basis, I introduced zero um, instead of going to trade fairs. I didn't do trade fairs anymore. And instead of doing that, I invested in something that all of my competitors didn't invest in. That was building a website, doing e-commerce, starting to do business with Amazon. Right. My, 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 the owner of, of my company, because it was not my own company, I was only managing director and CEO of the company, he kind of killed me. You're going to do business with Amazon. You must be crazy. And I said, no, because I want, I want, to, I want to conquer the, the American market. And if I want to conquer the American market the traditional way, I have to, have to, to, to find wholesalers and agents and stores. It's going to take me a lot of fortune. It is going to take me three, four, five years. And chances that it fails are big. If I try to do it via Amazon, maybe it fails. So what? But if it works, then I can scale it very fast. So right. that's the reason why I became obsessed by technology and my customer centricity. It was a necessity for me. And because of that boiling red ocean, and if I look at what is happening in the world right now because of technology, because of technology, I think that in between now and next five years, so before 2025, most traditional industry lines will blur. I told that, I call that a blurring of industry lines. Blurring of industry lines is boil, boiling. It's, a, it's another boiling red ocean. If all industry lines are disappearing and if all industries are melting down into one gigantic red ocean, then the only thing left is a red ocean strategy and a red ocean strategy is customer first and technology. Right, right. That's great. That's, that's a very interesting um, insight there. I think there's a lot of organizations out there that um, maybe aren't aware that they're in a boiling red ocean or maybe they do, but um, they're not quite sure um, how to differentiate themselves. Would, would you say that there are a lot of organizations uh, or, or this is probably a better question for those organizations that are in, in red boiling uh, oceans, boiling red oceans. Um, when do you know when to tweak what you're doing incrementally? Um, and when do you know when, how to radically transform how you're delivering value? Because I, I feel like there's a lot of emphasis put on doing those little micro tweaks, continuous yeah. improvement, um, but maybe not so much on being radically different and 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 um, hopping out of that boiling red ocean where everyone else is fighting for the same stuff. It, 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 it's not necessarily that you have to be radically different. It is think about what you're doing, think about and, and start to not fall in love with your perfect solution, but focus on what is happening in the world out there. What are my customers looking for or what might my customers be looking for? Um, it is, you know, it's the itch and the scratch. Right. Uh, what's the itch? Don't fall in love with your scratch, your perfect scratch, because then you make the mistake that Kodak made. We're right. in love with this perfect role film. Um, but, and, and their tagline was share moments. Share moments, but that role film, the, the itch is I want to share moments, and the scratch was the role film. But the distance between the itch and the scratch was pretty complex because think about a, tra a traditional role film that is quite complex you know yes you, can't, the, the, you have to wait until the whole role film is used then you have to wait four more days because your, your pictures need to be developed and then you cannot even share them in your social media because they're analog pictures and they're not di digital so all of a sudden those crap digital cameras came in our lives they were not good as they were not a perfect scratch but they were closer to the itch than the perfect scratch and so we moved to the not that perfect product because it served what we were looking for better than that perfect product and most companies make that mistake once they have a product they tend to forget about what was that product for and they start to think product 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 and let's improve the product and then they forget about the original problem so never fall in love with the solution, always stay in love with the original problem. And if you do that, then you, 
if you focus on the original problem, the only way you can focus on the original problem is to keep a close eye and to be as close as you can to the customer. And if the customer is changing, then you have to follow your customer. So whether it's radical or not, it's not your decision, it's the customer's decision. Right. It's the customer that decides how radical you have to change your interaction with the customer. Right, so, okay. Um, that's, that's what you need to do. Just keep, it's like in a normal relationship, follow your partner and follow your partner doesn't mean asking your partner all the time because if, if you would ask your wife all the time, hey, honey, what do you want? What do you want? What do you want? She's going to hate you in the end. She, <laughs> she, she wants you to kind of understand what she's looking for without you having to ask it all the time. And the only thing that you can do is try to be as close as you can to try to be empathetic, to try to understand what's going on in her life and how she sees life and, and how you can interact with that and, and improve how she is leading her life. And that's exactly what your customers are looking for from you as a company. And the only way you can do that is be close to your customer mm -hmm. and pay attention to your customer. So I, I'm, I'm not the type of guy that comes on stage and says, you need radical innovation. No. And is it incremental innovation? No, it depends on what is going on and, and how far are you off what's going on in the world. Yes. Jack Welsh once said, if the rate of change on the outside exceeds the rate of change on the inside, the end is near. So if the gap is, is big, then it's net radical innovation. But the, the mistake that most companies make is we'll deal with it when it happens. Right. Um, and then every time they need to go for huge innovations and radical innovation because they wait too long. Companies ask me, Rick, what is going to be the future? My answer is, I'm not a future religious. I don't know. I know that a couple of forces are coming together and it's the perfect storm. It's the melting down of all industry lines. That's going to happen. What comes out of that? I have no clue. Right. Okay, Rick, when is it going to happen? And then my answer is soon. And too soon for those that are not prepared and not soon enough for those that are prepared. That's the answer. Right. <laughs> yeah. And, and so when, when you look at an organisation like Apple, um, as another example, um, they obviously uh, developed a product um, that for, from my personal um, perspective, um, I actually didn't even realise I needed an iPhone or I yeah. wanted an iPhone before yeah. I had it sitting in my yeah. hand. So is yeah. that because Apple, um, they, they weren't asking their customers, what do you want? Because I would have never said, I want an iPhone, um, but they, they got close enough to hear um, their, um, I guess, what, what, what would make their life easier or better. And then they go about developing. If you, if you, look, if you look at that, that famous speech of Steve Jobs in 2007, when he introduced the iPhone, at a certain moment, he says, iPhone is like having your life in your pocket. He didn't have to ask the customers. In most of the cases, you know, if you're close enough to the customers. We were carrying like four or five devices. And the only thing that he did was put all those devices into one device. Right. And so to bring all your life and that was I needed that device and I needed that device and I needed that device into one device and then there was a second thing that he did and again it is about the interface and I'm obsessed by the interface just like Steve was um, I always say make sure that your interface is a feast fast easy accessible simple and tempting and Steve was always obsessed by the interface he has introduced a couple of interfaces. Uh, you're carrying one of the interfaces for the moment in your ears. Um, he introduced the, 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 the mouse. He introduced the touchpad. He introduced the touchscreen. I mean, all of a sudden, the interface between us and that phone was no longer a keyboard, but our fingers. That's the easiest interface you can imagine because you always have it with you. Yes. And it's intuitive because it's your fingers. Right. So that was his secret. So two elements. First of all, just realize, again, what problem are we solving? 
people have to carry those three or four devices. I put everything in one device. Yeah, that device is extremely expensive, $500. I don't know whether you know that movie with Steve Ballmer uh, a couple of weeks after the launch of the iPhone. He was being asked by, what do you think about the iPhone? And he's laughing out loud, lol. Yeah, laughing out loud, literally. Say, the iPhone, $500 for a thing that's not even a good uh, email machine because it hasn't, doesn't have a keyboard. He was laughing out loud because he didn't believe that people would pay $500 for an iPhone, especially not business people. And the CEO of Nokia called the iPhone one year after the launch of the iPhone a niche product. So if I'm in front of a, of a, of a room, I'm always asking, who has an iPhone? And then like 90% of the hands go up. And then I say, you all have a niche product. Come on. I mean, and that is being blind. And that is the danger for companies. Why did Nokia turn a blind eye? There is this amazing study about Nokia. Um, there's a study run by the Alto Business University of Helsinki and INSEAD in Singapore about why Nokia failed on the war over smartphone. And they say it was a company culture. It was a company culture. It was top down, uh, management by command, um, rigid processes, and based on assumptions. Right. Um, they no longer were in tune with the outside world. They thought that they understand the outside world, but they were looking at the outside world through the lens of their product. And if you look at the outside world through the lens of your product, you don't see what's actually going on. And I think that was one of the things that Steve was very good at. It's no longer, it, it, it never looked at the outside world through the lens of a product. He was looking what's going on and how can I develop a product to serve that need that people don't even know that they have that need. Right, right. And when you look at um, ancient or um, older organisations, um, so looking at uh, big banks or, uh, you know, anyone in the financial services space, utilities, telecommunications, um, th these guys that have been around for decades, um, if not yeah. centuries, um, how, how do they, I guess, adapt with the times? Because obviously over the last 15, 10, 15, 20 years, we've had a lot of uh, startup companies disrupt entire industries. But how, yeah. how do these big, older organisations ensure that they, um, they don't turn out like um, uh, Nokia or, or one of these um, larger organisations, but they can actually continue to pivot and adapt and stay the market leader? I think that the, the big problem that they were facing in the beginning, um, and there is this amazing letter to his shareholders by James Jamie Dimon, Jamie Dimon, CEO of JP Morgan Chase, big American bank. He wrote a letter to his shareholders in 2015. It was the 10th of April, 2015. Um, and in that letter to his shareholders, he says, I lay awake at night. I lay awake at night because of the startups in Silicon Valley. They're eating Wall Street's lunch. They're eating our lunch. The problem is, it's not one big company. It's not one company that we have to fight. Like in the past, one bank was fighting another bank. It's like a thousand small entities that are eating small stuff. They're not eating an entire bank. They're focusing on one element of the bank and they're doing that a lot better. But if you read that letter, he is indicating why this is happening. He says, we've made three major mistakes. The first mistake that we've made is we've underestimated digi the digitization of society. We thought for way too long that digital was just a layer upon the old society or was a channel, you know, talking about the digital channel and that was just a channel. But no, it has changed the whole society. The second, he says, as such, we have been confronted with a new type of customer, new customer needs. And, and then he indicates the real reason he says we as a bank have been way too obsessed by our own internal processes and procedures and we've forgotten about the customer we've turned inside inside it's not even inside out it's inside inside um and it, he says it's in between the gap between what customers actually want and what we do as a bank that the starts for silicon valley can develop their business um and the third is we've underestimated the speed of change it's happening faster than we could ever even imagine. Now, 
I'm involved in a couple of banks in, in trying to coach them into, hey, what do you need to do? And it's very simple. Again, it starts with the smallest unit. And the smallest unit is try to focus uh, every meet. Uh, there's a bank that, that um, I'm guiding that opens up every meeting in every branch with not with numbers, not with daily issues. It start by taking one customer frustration, one, and turn that into customer delight. Okay, what's the customer frustration of today? What's the customer frustration of this week? What's the customer frustration of this month? From um, the lowest level meetings to the top end meetings, even the board, when the board is meeting, it starts with taking away one customer frustration and turn that into customer delight. If you do that all the time, then there is no chance that startups can come in between you and your customer. It's companies that create that gap. We call it digital disruption, but it's not disruption. So if you do that as a bank all the time, and if you have the guts to do that, because it takes guts to do that, then you create your own disruption. Then it doesn't feel like disruption. It's just what you need to do. You're right. doing it for the customer. So focus on the customer. It's as simple as that. Yes. Okay. And um, when, I guess, for those organizations that, um, you know, are, are looking at managing the way they deliver value, so managing the, those sequence of tasks or activities, managing their business processes, um, obviously there is um, the internal processes. So what do our employees do? Um, and then there's the external process or the journey, the customer journey, yeah. the, 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 the um, steps that the customer goes on. Um, do you feel like there has been more um, too much of an F emphasis on the internal processes, the way that you know we we do things because it's easier to see, it's easier to measure, um, maybe it's harder to understand what the customer journey is actually like. What are they actually doing? Do you feel like there's too much emphasis on what's going internally, um, or what are your thoughts around that? No, there's there's too much emphasis. Uh, there's there's two examples I can give. The first is. Look at how companies have been automating what they do. I don't know any company that started with a CRM system. They always start with an ERP system. Right. It starts with let's, let's freeze. And because that is what you do, you freeze and it's not even freezing. It's making them rigid. Let's make our internal processes rigid. Right. So we control them. So you start with making a rigid insight. And then you have that rigid insight. You have your process and procedures. What you do on the, at, at the same time is you make it as easy as you can for yourself. Yeah, that's how you start. Most companies start like that. So what do you end with? You end with, okay, we have this rigid core of the company. That's the core of the company. That's already a mistake because your inside is not the core of the company. But by starting there and by making that rigid, you turn it into the core of your company. Right. And then on the outskirts, you have customers. And then on top of that, you implement a CRM system. But your CRM system, that needs to be fluid because your customers are fluid, can't be fluid because you have to put it on top of a rigid ARP system. Right. And all the complexity that you've taken out of the core, you need to push it somewhere. And where do you push it? Into the market. So companies make life easy for themselves by making it complex for their customers. Right, okay. Um, and so that's the reason why it is, it is wrong. By, it's it's by, by design, companies are not customer-centric by design because they design inside out. I don't know any large company that designs outside in. But that's right. what you need to do. You need right. to design outside in. What is my customer want? And so close to the customer, you have to be fluid. And that means a combination of tech and touch. You need people and you need technology. Technology not to freeze it, but technology to make it hyper interactive and hyper um, personal. And you can do that with technology. I reckon, Daniel, that you're on Spotify. I'm on Spotify. Are you on Spotify? Yeah. yeah. Your Spotify is different than my Spotify. Right, yeah, right. Absolutely. I'm 200% mm. I'm, I'm sure that your Spotify is different than mine. 
Yes, your right. personal, your Spotify is personalized, and mine is personalized. How come? Because it's technology. So technology can help you to hyper personalize and to make it very fluid. Because it's fluid. If you change, your Spotify will change, and if I change, my Spotify will change. So right. it is fluid. And if you can put touch upon that human touch, then you are very customer centric, and that means that deeper inside of your organization. In my model, further on the outskirts of your customer centricity, that is the actual processes that you need to do, of course, processes need to be scalable. So of course, processes need to be processes and need to be not rigid, but frozen. But if you freeze them, you can defreeze them at any time, but right. don't make them rigid. Yes. And so make it as simple as you can for your customer and then push the complexity inside of your organization. You know, think about Uber. Mm. You can describe the Uber experience on a beer cart. Take a beer cart, you can write down, this is the Uber experience. It's yes. as simple as that. Yes. Write down your Spotify experience. It's as simple as that. Right. You don't want to know how complex it is to actually realize that. But as a customer, you don't notice. Yes. But if you do business with a bank, it's 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 not it's still not as simple as taking an Uber. Yes. Why? Why? Because an, the, the Uber organization is as complicated as running a bank, maybe even more complicated, but you don't notice it as a customer. Right. That's what banks need to realize. Make it as simple. As make it a feast, fast, easy, accessible, simple, and tempting, and then you win. Yes, yeah, that's amazing. It, yeah, sorry, so you, you go. Yeah, I, I want to say it's about the, the, the monopoly of the mind. You know, if you make it fast, easy, accessible, simple, and tempting, you make it, you turn it into a habit. Mm. I mean, if you're if you used to taking an Uber taxi and I'm, I'm a frequent traveler or I was a frequent traveler before mm. COVID-19. I did like 200 gigs on a, on a, on a yearly basis. So I, I traveled all continents and all, all countries in a year. Mm. Um, so um, when I arrive in a city where there is no Uber, I feel like, oh shit, what is this? I have to take a normal taxi. I don't want that. Where's yeah. my Uber? Mm. So it turns into a habit. Um, and it turns into a dissatisfier when it's not around. And that leads me to the most important question in the world. The most important question in the world that companies can ask is, what would my customers miss if I were not there? Right. If you have an answer to that, you can never be disrupted. Right. But if my right. bank would ask me, what would you miss? And if they just do banking, what would you miss if I was not there? Okay. I would go to another bank. Um, but if my bank, and um, I'm with a bank like that now, that has the best app in the world, the best banking app in the world, which is way more than just a banking app, which is a kind of personal assistant in my daily life that has got to do with buying and, and, and stuff and, and money, I would miss it. So they're pretty close to that answer. What would I miss if Uber would not be there? Jeez, oh, I would have to take all those crap, those taxis again. Shit, no. What would I miss if booking would no longer be there? Having to try to find a hotel in every single city, forget it. I go to booking and I book my hotel. I yes. Mean, that's what we need to, to, and every company can do that, but you have to think about, what problem are we solving? And if we do that better than, and not 10% better, but 10 times better than we used to do it, let's make it as simple as we can for our customers. No matter how complex it is for our inside, everything complex internally, you can solve it with technology. Right. Believe me. Right. Yeah, yeah no, that, that's interesting. It, it reminds me of this conversation I have had with with uh, another guest on this um, in this series, actually, where they were talking about a a hospital um, that they were analysing their data of uh, fifteen hundred um, patients 
um, yeah. that were supposedly um, following the same process or the, the same yeah. patient journey. Um, they analysed 1,500 different uh, uh, cases of, of this, uh, of this, the one process, and they found yeah. out there were 800 variations to this process that they were they thought was a very simple one one process. 1,500 patients got went through the same process. Actually, there's 800 variations. Thank you for this bridge, because the, the, the problem that most companies have and the biggest mistake is, OK, now we're aware that we have to put the customer in the center of the universe. Now, let's design, let's design the customer experience. And then you design one customer experience and you kind of put it in process and procedures. But every single customer is different and every single customer interaction is different. So you can't instruct your people how to be customer centric by putting it into process and procedures. If customer right. A does this, then you need to do B. And if it does B, then you need to do C. But it doesn't work like that. Right. Every customer and every customer interaction is a happening. And the happening is if it's something that happens at that specific moment in between those two specific people or in between a company and the customer. And it's different every time. So the only way you can instruct your people how to be customer centric is to have customer centricity in the heart of the culture of your company and to allow your people and to empower your people to be customer centric. Right. And that is why I say it takes guts to be a customer centric company because it's easy said. Um, the danger is you put it into processes and procedures because that's how you are used to run a company. Um, and then you instruct your people what they need to do. But that's, now, that's not how customer centricity works. Customer centricity, again, is fluid. So you can only instruct your people to be fluid. And okay, but what then can we do? And what is it that we can't do? And then as a business leader, you have to say, I don't know. It depends. So you have to instruct them on the values of the company. What are the values of the company? What's the company culture? And you have to empower them to help the customer inside of the values of the company. And that's a different ballgame again. Yes, right, right. And let's just say we've got an employee that is in a senior management um, and they have a very sort of customer-centric way of managing their, their part of the organisation. What happens yeah. when they move on after being with the organisation for, I don't know, 20, 30 years um, and they've really en uh, encouraged and fostered that uh, customer-centric mindset? Um, where, what happens when that the, their replacement comes in. Um, I, I guess it could be from within or it could be an external replacement. Um, how, I guess, how can you ensure that, that the person coming in and taking on that role um, doesn't go all the way back to square one um, in, in terms of understanding what the customer needs? Um, but they, they come into that role. Um, is, is there an element of some sort of documentation required so they, they, can, um, they can sort of understand and pick up, oh, this is, this is how our customers respond to us. This is what they need from us. Um, this is where we need to, this is where I need to start from. Um, is there some sort of documentation required or is it more of a culture thing that if the culture has been bred, um, then that person coming into that role will be supported by a team that has a very customer centric approach? I think uh, you, you're given the answer. It, it's culture, 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 culture. Okay. Um, it is, it's in the, it's in the air, it's in, in the atmosphere of an organization, whether the, the organization is customer centric or not. Mm. And it doesn't start with the top and it doesn't uh, start with the but it, it, is, it is all sides at the same time. Um, and it's in the culture of the company. And culture is not something that you can change overnight. It, it takes a while to change the culture, but once a culture is changed and the culture has been changed from, we are a product oriented company, like still 99% of the companies, um, into we become a real customer-centric organization. Once you become a customer-centric organization, it's like now if people start to work in a product-oriented company, 
even if you are very aware how you have to help a customer, you kind of forget to do that after a couple of months or after a couple of weeks. Um, and that's because of the culture. So if you have a customer-centric culture, it's already way easier to find somebody new and he or she will adapt to the, to the, to the company culture or not. And when he or she doesn't adapt to the company culture, the company culture will kind of push them out. Yeah, it, it, it works like that. The second thing that I would recommend companies to do is to, um, I'm writing, um, I'm, I'm introducing a new book on the 20th of October um, and I'm already writing a new one. And the new one, I'm writing it on the net curiosity score. I'm introducing a new KPI, which is the net curiosity score. Um, because if you look at the one element that companies need to become really customer centric, um, both as a company, but also what do you, what is the most important skill of my people to fit into a, a customer centric organization? It's curiosity. Um, how curious are you? How curious are you about the outside world? Because if you're curious as a company about the outside world, you don't look at the outside world through that one lens of your product. You look at different lenses and, and through different lenses and in a different way through the outside world. But also, how can you make sure that your people are customer centric if they're curious about the customer? Because what is that one really valuable thing that you can give your customer? It's attention. And what is curiosity lead to? It's attention. You right. give attention, you give time and attention to your customer. So it's about curiosity. So if I engaged people in the past, I was always looking how, how curious are you? Because if you're curious, you can help me in my culture, you can help me in being customer centric and you have growth potential. Because if you're curious, you're also having growth potential. The second question, um, if people ask me, okay, Rick, can you describe the job? Then I did this and I said, but you are the job. The job is not the job description. It's what you do with the job. Right. It's how you see that job. So I'm asking you, look, this is, this is your job, but how do you see the job? I would yes. reverse question. Right. Right. Talking about reversing questions, another reversing question is, I hate it when companies say, yeah, Rick, but our customers are not loyal anymore. Yeah, but that's the wrong question. The right question should be, how loyal are you to your customers? Right. How okay. much time and attention and curiosity do you put into your customer? Think about that. It's not that customers are not loyal to you. Mm. You are not loyal to your customers because now with this tool, we can have a two-way communication with many. Mm. So and that is what, what has changed. In the past, we had one to many. We had a one-way communication with many customers. Mm. But now we can have a two-way communication with many customers. Right. And if you don't do that two-way communication with your customers, that is not only send, but also listen to your customers, mm. you're not loyal to your customers. So don't ask how loyal are your customers to you. Right, right. Yeah. Yeah, that's great. And um, I guess organizations in uh, heavily... Uh, regulated industries, um, I, I guess you, you're probably looking at financial services as a, as a big one. Um, Banks, insurance companies, pharma companies, yeah. Yeah. How do, how do they, I guess, uh, uh, um, uh, take on or, or adopt this uh, fluid approach where you, you are listening to your customers, you, you, you are trying to keep your finger on the pulse, you are trying to adapt to the market, but then you also need to show the auditors, um, hey, we, we um, know what we're doing, we have that documented down somewhere, um, and, and we can clearly show you what we're doing. How do you balance that, that line between trying to um, keep customers first 
um, and being quick to, I guess, tend to the customer's needs, but also aware, aware that, hey, we've got auditors that are going to come and check on us and make sure that what we're doing, we have that down somewhere. Yeah, but I think that people have a misunderstanding about innovation and, and being creative. If, if, right. I'm, if I'm a creative writer, I have a white sheet of paper and I have the words that people have been using for centuries. Right. I don't have anything new. I have to work with the blocks that are there. If okay. I'm a painter, I have to work with a number of colors and I work out on the canvas and that canvas has got its limitations into the frame. So um, I, I see too many banks and insurance companies and pharma companies that are kind of using this, yeah, but we are highly regulated as a reason not to be innovative, not right. to put the customer in the center of the universe. So mm. it is being fluid within the frame. It's being flexible within the frame. Right. The frame is there. Yeah, absolutely. But it's not because there is a frame that you can't look, okay, the frame is my base. I can't change it. Right. Um, never try to fight the war that you cannot win. So right. I can't change the frame. I need to, I need to, that needs to be okay. But that's not the reason why on top of that, that frame, I cannot be more clever than other companies, more closer to my customers than other companies. That's, that's uh, you know, that's BS. It, it, that you, can't, you, you can't use that frame as a reason not to be customer centric. No right. way. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's great. And, and when, when, we, when you look at the future of a customer-centric organisation, what, what, what trends are you seeing and, and what are you expecting to happen over the next two, three, five years? Where, where would you be encouraging organisations to, um, uh, I guess, focus their time, effort and energy when it comes to being customer-centric? Now, obviously, every organisation is going to be starting at a different point, um, but but where do they need to be aiming for? There's um, there's two important elements. The first is um, what I see as as the biggest trend for the future is hyper personalization. Um, people want to be treated like an individual, and we know we can be treated like an individual. We no longer be want to be um, part of a procedure. We want to be the alpha and the omega of the procedure. We want to, to be, I'm the procedure. And it's my case. I'm not a case, I'm not a number, it's me. Um, you have to do things for me. So hyper-personalization doesn't mean that everybody needs a different product, but it means that I want to be treated like an individual. And that is, right. that's key. So companies that are not capable of connecting to many and engaging individuals, because that's my magic formula, connect to many engaged individuals, they're doomed. People want to be treated like an individual. So that's, that's the biggest challenge over the next five years. It's not even 10 years. The next five years, hyper-personalization. That's, that's, that's wrong. The only way you can do that is by gathering data. Because the more data, if we're talking to each other, the longer we're talking to each other, the more data I have about you and you about me, and the more personal our conversation will become. Um, and that's exactly the same with the customer. So the more you have a conversation with your customer, the more you listen to your customer, the more you're curious about your customer, the more data you collect about your customer, and the better you will be able to serve that customer as an individual. So... It's about collecting, processing, and activating data. Now, most companies forget how valuable their actual business model is. They're looking at their actual business model. They're looking at the business model canvas as how do I make money? Um, you know, the things I need to do, my cost and my profitability, the things I do for my customers, and then if I make more value with my customers than my cost, I have profit. That's how companies look at their business model. And they're talking about digital disruption. But if I look at a business model, and that's what I do with companies, I'm not only looking, how do you make money, but also how can you make data? Because every transaction that you do with a customer is a sort of data. So, and it's free of charge because you're doing it anyway. Right. But every day, every hour, every transaction 
that you do with a customer that you don't turn into ones and zeros and into data that you collect somewhere is a day lost, is data lost. And we all know that data is the next money. It's the next, it's, 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 it's your future money. So we can produce future money right now, free of charge. And most companies forget to do it. They have this 100 sales reps out there somewhere in the market. What are they doing? We don't have a clue. They're doing something. No, they have interactions with customers. They can collect customer data like crazy. You could be the richest company in the world if you would collect all those data. Why don't you do it? I mean, in the Middle Ages, people have been trying for centuries to be able to take metal and to turn that metal into gold. Now we can. Every day. And companies don't realize it. And then you have data collecting machines like Uber, like Airbnb, like Netflix, like Spotify. They have already, they, they know it. And in five years time, we're going to look at them and say, but we can never catch up. Yeah, hey guys, you missed the opportunity because five years ago, I told you collect data like crazy. And then companies tell me, yeah, Rick, but we don't know what we're going to do with those data. And I said, I don't give a shit that you don't know what you're going to do with your data. The data will tell you what you can do with those data when it's time. And when it's time and you find out that you need data and you didn't collect them, then you're going to say, we should have collected them. It's too late. That's amazing. Yeah. <laughs> well, Rick, it's been an absolute pleasure having you on the podcast series. Um, it's been a very exciting conversation and I've certainly been uh, taking a lot of notes and, and gleaning a lot from you. And I know that our audience will glean a lot uh, from you as well. But for anyone yeah. that's listening to the podcast, um, feel free to connect with Rick on LinkedIn. Uh, you've got a book coming out uh, next month yeah. in October. Um, yeah, and, it's and called so The Guide to the Ecosystem Economy.